friends. Welcome to another midweek check-in. Today I want to offer to you two of the things I've been reflecting on in my prayers this week. First, I've been using a devotional and it has been adjusted in the last week, meant to be adapting to the coronavirus crisis, what it means for us to be in quarantine and at a time of uncertainty. And so each day has invited us into another specific prayer, hope, prayers for courage, prayers for resiliency. One of them was a prayer that invited us to name our fear and then to take time and listen for what it was that God had to say in response. That's one of the ones I've been reflecting on a lot this week. The whole idea of what does it mean to name your fear and to do so plainly. The invitation was not to sugarcoat fear, was not to pretend it wasn't there, that everything was just fine. It wasn't to hide it away in a corner unseen, but was meant truly to shine a spotlight on what are the fears in the midst of this time, to name them boldly, trusting that God would boldly answer. And so one of the fears that I named, there were a number of them as I wrote them down and offered them to God. One that I named is what if when this is all said and done, church isn't there the way it has been. I don't think in terms of church will stop being But what if it's not the same? What if new habits have formed in this time and no one comes back on Sundays? I named before God this fear that maybe church would not be there as I always knew it. And I offered this before God and I listened for what it was that God's response would be. And the response that I got, the words that were prompted within me, were what then if church is everywhere instead? Everywhere in the sense that we always hope that church will always be outside the confine, outside the four walls where we sometimes confine it. What if church then becomes everywhere in a way we've always hoped it to be, but have not always lived it? It was comforting in a different way. It wasn't the comfort of assurance, everything will be okay, everything will be the same. It was the comfort of resiliency, of a God who continues to create, of a vision of hope that maybe the truth is that we will more fully live church everywhere. we are. I still hope you all come back on Sunday though. I miss that time together. But I have been invited to reflect. The Spirit, I think, has invited me to reflect a bit on what it means for church to be everywhere. The second thing that I have been reflecting on has, um, it's a quote that I came across a long time ago kind of got sucked away in my head, but then the context of it forgotten, I found it again. It's interesting because the way I want to describe this time is a little bit like a roller coaster, which feels very strange to say because every day is so painfully the same. So it feels a little strange to say that it feels like a roller coaster, but it does. There are these great, wonderful moments that are full of life and joy, these moments of slowness and Sabbath and togetherness that I have otherwise missed when I go a a million miles a minute. And then there have been low lows when fears overtake me or when exhaustion overtakes me from trying to figure out all that is happening. When the exhaustion of being with the ones you love gets so much because We're people, and especially some of us are toddlers. (laughs) Mine really is a toddler, of course. And our tempers come to an end. Patience comes to an end, and we all want out. We want life as we knew it. 
And so it's strange in the monotonous every day to make it feel like a roller coaster. And so I came back to that quote that I had found a while ago that had lodged itself just enough that I could pull it back up in my mind. And I want to share it with you today. It's by G.K. Chesterton, who was a writer as well as a lay member in his church who reflected upon God in his own life. And so I want to offer these words which reflect on monotony and how it might be an overflow of life. It begins with reference to children. Children have a bounding vitality because they are in spirit fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he or she is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we. The repetition in nature may not be a mere reoccurrence. It may be a theatrical encore. My friend, some of the language is a little bit reflective of the time in which uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote. I'm not sure he means that actual aging itself is some sort of sin. I believe it is a blessing of life. But the ability that we lose when we no longer rejoice in life that is renewed day by day, minute by minute, unchanging and good and steadfast. That I believe is the sin pointed out. One that I have felt very much in this time when the monotony has gotten exhausting. And yet I love the idea that perhaps it is theatrical encore, that God has simply not tired of it yet. Not tired of me, not tired of you, not tired of us. But we'll wake up day after day after day, moment after moment after moment, and say, let's do it again. My friends, my prayer for you this week is that we would in these days be overflowed with that spirit of God that makes space to hear our prayers and offer a word of comfort in the midst of it. May we be overflowed with the spirit of God that never tires of day by day doing it again, being with us again in every small moment of each day. My dear friends, may we rejoice in our God. Amen.